And I want to begin by speaking about the gospel and how it is that God has chosen to save mankind. The word gospel means good news. In fact, it's stronger than that. The word gospel means great news. And the gospel is great news. And what the gospel is, is it speaks of the way that God has provided for sinful man to be forgiven of our sins and then to enter into a relationship with God Almighty who created us and to be in that relationship forever and ever and ever. And perhaps the greatest definition of the gospel in all of the Bible is found in chapter 15 of this very same letter where Paul wrote, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which you also received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preach to you unless you believed in vain. And then here it is, his description of the gospel. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scripture. And the gospel, God's good news to sinful man concerning salvation, is made up of three parts. Number one, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins in order to pay the full and satisfying payment that was required for the forgiveness of sins. Number two, that he was buried. And then number three, that he rose again on the third day, just as the Old Testament prophecies had prophesied the Messiah would do. During Jesus' public ministry, he had declared that he would provide mankind with salvation and the forgiveness of sins. A satis- that his, he would lay his life down as a full and satisfying payment for the forgiveness of our sins. He said the Son of Man did not come into the world to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for us. Now, when the hour of his crucifixion came, Jesus died to pay the price for the forgiveness of our sins. But how in the world are we supposed to know as human beings that his sacrifice on the cross was acceptable to God? That he really was who he said he was and then what he said Uh, was true. And God's answer to all of that is the resurrection. The resurrection is the evidence that the Father accepted the perfect sacrifice of His Son for the forgiveness of our sins. Isn't that wonderful? I think that it is wonderful. And the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is God's way of confirming to us that our faith in Jesus Christ is well placed. And that when a person comes to God and says something like this to God in prayer, God, I believe that I am a sinner. I believe that I've been less than perfect all of my life. I also believe that my sin has separated me from a relationship with you, the relationship that I've been created for and the relationship without which nothing in life will make sense. But I also believe that you love me so much that you sent your Son into the world to die that death upon the cross, that a whosoever like me could put my trust and my faith in him and gain everlasting life. And so this morning, Lord, I choose to put my faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins, for an to begin an everlasting relationship with you. And when a person says something like that to God, the greatest miracle that can happen in a human life occurs, and that is God Almighty in the person of the Holy Spirit comes into that individual person's life, and that person is now born again by the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus said we needed to be born again. We've been born physically, but we were born dead spiritually when we were born physically. So we need a spiritual birth. And by putting our faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, we receive that spiritual birth and now have the capacity for relationship with God. And all of it is a free gift from God because we could never earn it. And the salvation that Jesus provides us with is a salvation that absolutely overwhelms and dominates our past and our present and our future. Concerning our past, it provides us with a complete forgiveness of every sin we've ever committed. I can't change my past. I can't change my sin. What I need is forgiveness, and God provides me with that forgiveness as He does with every Christian and anyone who would become a Christian. Concerning sin in the present tense and salvation in the present tense, by putting my faith in Christ, He provides me with a will and a power to live a completely different life. God doesn't just forgive me of my sins and then say, now today you have to live the life you've always lived in the bondage of sin on and on and on until you one day go into heaven. The Holy Spirit comes into our life and gives us the ability to live an entirely different kind of life. And this salvation reaches all the way out into our futures when one day we will be in that heavenly scene and standing before that throne and at that point in time delivered from ever coming into contact with sin ever again for the rest of eternity. I want us to notice in this passage and specifically in verses 22 and 23 man's general response to God's offer of the gospel uh, to us. He said concerning the Jews, characteristically, the Jews request a sign. Their attitude was kind of show me. They, uh, they, that they would believe something if some miracle were shown to them to affirm that truth. The Jews in the ancient world were very different from the Greeks or from the Gentiles. The Jews were not interested in the pursuit of uh, wisdom. They didn't get lost in their heads in some kind of uh, intellectualism. And the reason that they didn't give themselves to uh, intellectualism, so to speak, or into the pursuit of wisdom in the way that the Greeks did is because in their mind, and rightfully so, they, they already possessed the greatest wisdom that could be possessed in human history at the time, and that was the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets. So they weren't on a search for the meaning of life. They weren't on a search for the purpose of life. They weren't on the search for kind of dotting I's and crossing T's and intellectual discussion about do you put your right shoe on first or your left shoe on first all the way to the big questions in life. Those things were all answered for them in the Word of God. For the Jew, it was necessary that a message be confirmed by a physical miracle of some sort. And this is why the Jewish religious leaders were constantly coming to Jesus and asking him for a miracle, asking him for some kind of, of a sign in order to confirm his claim to be the Messiah and to be the very Son of God. It wasn't like they didn't have any signs. Jesus had filled the whole land of Israel with miracles top to bottom, left to right for three and a half years. You couldn't go into any part of Israel where he hadn't raised somebody from the dead or he hadn't restored sight to the blind. He hadn't given deaf ears the ability to hear once again. Cleansing of the lepers on and on. John writes in his gospel that if they recorded everything that Jesus said and do, uh, did in the course of those three and a half years, the whole world couldn't contain the books that could be written on it. There were changed lives all over the landscape of Israel, and yet they would continue to come to him and ask him for some kind of a sign or some kind of a miracle. All, and so Jesus performed 
just nonstop series of signs and wonders and miracles. And all of them were accomplished by Jesus for the purpose of confirming his claim to be the Savior of the world and the Son of God. Jesus didn't just come and do miracles or signs and wonders to say, where it's the uh, Bullwinkle and Rocky show. Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. He didn't do all of these miracles just to say, I just want to show you what I can do and you can't do, so you'll be in awe of me. The Bible refers to the miracles of Jesus and the miracles of the apostles in the book of Acts that referred to as signs and wonders. They were deliberate. They were deliberately, specifically chosen things that Jesus did to communicate something to mankind about himself. Signs and wonders. What is a wonder? A wonder is when something happens that stops us dead in our tracks and it makes us think about what we've just seen. I've never seen that before. That's amazing. I'm going to stop everything that I'm doing, everything that I'm thinking. I'm going to give that my full attention. That's a wonder. And that's what a wonder is intended to do. When Jesus broke into human history and did what he did over and over and over again, it was to try and get people to stop in the everyday of their life watch what they had just seen him do and to realize there's another kingdom that's in our midst. Nobody does this kind of thing. I've never seen that in my life. That, what, that which he has just done causes me to wonder about him. It stops me in my tracks and it makes me think about him. And that's what a wonder is intended to do. And that's what the miracles are intended to do as a person today reads of the life of Jesus in the Gospels, where a person stops and begins to wonder about such a life as the life of Christ. What is a sign? Well, we're, our lives are dominated by signs. We couldn't get by without signs. And signs are the means by which we get from one place in life to another place in life. Let's say in a car, I'm over here and I want to get to some place in the Bay Area or some place in Wyoming or wherever it might be. What do we do? We follow the signs. And if we follow the signs and obey them, those signs will deliver us safely to our destination. And what is true of physical signs is true of spiritual signs. Here we are over here. Jesus does the signs that he does. And if we will look at those signs and see where they lead, they will always lead to a faith in Christ as the Son of God and as our Savior and bring us spiritually, safely to the end of our journey and the end of our search. That was the meaning of the miracles and all of the signs and all of the wonders. They weren't just mere demonstrations of power. Now, late in Jesus' public ministry, he did yield one more time to the request of the Jewish religious leaders for a sign. And they wanted another sign from him to prove that he was the Messiah and that he was the Son of God. And Jesus said to them, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign, but no sign will be given unto it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. And as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of that great fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Speaking of his death, his burial, and his resurrection, he would be crucified, he would die, and only remain in that condition for three days before he would be resurrected.